And so as we learn more about the Proverbs, we're going to find ourselves doing things more pleasing to the Lord than we did before. And let's see, here I am, Proverbs chapter number 1. Now, we're going to learn a scripture song first. It's just one verse. This is a verse that little kids can learn. It's 110. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. This is, this is a single verse. Little kids can learn it. Big kids can learn it. Teenagers can learn it. It's so simple, even adults can learn it. You probably know how it goes. Do y'all sing that in junior church? It's been a while? Okay. So if you don't catch on the first time, we'll sing it through two or three times. And so you help me out. This is a good way to learn scripture is when you learn a verse, put it to a tune, then it just kind of lodges in your head. You know how you think of things sometimes, a, a song that you hadn't heard in a long time and it comes to memory and it begins to roll over and over and over in your head since I got that Thunderbird. When I was a kid, now this, this is my carnal past before I was saved, I, I, the Beach Boys sang a song like, she's going to have fun, fun, fun till daddy takes the T-bird away. And I, that thing's been going on in my mind today. I can't push it out, try to get rid of it. And the one, one phrase in that song that always bothered me was, you know, the Beach Boys sing in a real high-pitched voice. And so they're singing about this girl that's borrowed her daddy's T-bird and they're singing this one phrase that I, even when I was young, I guess I was hard to hear it and I couldn't make it out. It sounded like she drives, she, she walks like an ape now. And it's supposed to be a pretty enticing young girl. And, it, and the song says, she drives like an ape now. Well, how does walking like an ape, how does that stem from a thunderbird? Well, I looked up the lyrics today to see if it really said that. You know what it said? Now for 50 years, I thought it said she walks like an ape now. It says she drives like an ace now. <laughs> she drives like an ace. Well, I'm glad to know that girl didn't look like an ape anyway. <laughs> well, we're going to sing Proverbs chapter 1, verse number 10. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not, consent thou not, consent thou not. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Oh, he's got it up there. Okay, he's cheating. All right, so you don't have to open your Bible. See, I was going to make you open your Bible so you get used to it. Let's sing it again. You ready? Consent thou not. Consent thou not. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. No! And you, you have the kids learn that. At the end of it, you teach them to say, no! Can you do that? Do it with me one time, real, real loud. Ready? No! Now let's sing it through one time, and on the last, we'll go through it twice, and at the end you say no and point your finger, your finger because we're not going to consent to the sinners, right? Well, you'd want to. <laughs> Should we vote on this? <laughs> okay. Like the president went to uh, church one Sunday and his wife didn't go. This was back years ago. I think it's Coolidge. He came home and, and his wife was sick, and she said, well, what did the preacher preach on today? He said, well, he preached on sin. She said, well, what did he say about sin? He said, I, I don't know. He said, I think he was against it. <laughs> so, well, we've we got to be against sin too, and that's why we're singing this song. Verse number 10, once again, consent thou not, consent thou not, my sin, is my <laughs> consent thou not. Let's do it one more time. Consent thou not, consent thou not, my son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. No, there we go. I called it, I called the son sin. That was, that was bad, wasn't it? <laughs> okay. All right, let's read uh, beginning in verse number, well, let's see, verse number 10 is the first one that we want to talk about tonight. So we'll read the whole section from 10 through 19. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah, 19. All right, ready? I'm, I'm going to read and you follow along. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as though that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. 
My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Thank you for the passage of Scripture that will surely instruct us and all who are ready to receive it. I pray that you'd bless us by the presence of the Holy Spirit of God that he might give us ears to hear and hearts to receive it. I pray you'd bless now in Jesus' precious and wonderful name. Amen. And I don't know what year it was. I was, I think, 16, maybe 17 years old. <clears throat> I was driving my 59 Chevy. <laughs> I love old cars. <laughs> that, I, that was an old car then. I was ashamed of it then, but boy, I wish I had it now. Had a 59 Chevy driving down the road with some friends of mine down this hilly, curvy road in the dark, moonless night driving along about 10 or 11 o'clock at night, going 60 miles an hour, and guess what happened? The headlights went out. I mean, the headlights just went completely out. There's no light at all, going 60 miles an hour. Well, what would you do? <laughs> ah! <laughs> I thought about that, but I don't think it would have helped any. I did all I, my instinct told me to do. I hit the brakes and held that steering wheel as tight as I could as straight as I could, hoping there's not a curve out there somewhere. Well, lo and behold, it came to a stop. Everybody in the car is yelling and hollering. <laughs> Nobody knows what's going on. So I finally get it stopped, and praise the Lord, we're still in the road. Well, I thought I had just experienced, in spite of the lights going out, by being able to stop it without wrecking us, I I thought I had just experienced what they call good luck. Now I see, now that I'm a Christian, now I look back and see there was just a merciful God having grace and, and pity and compassion on a fool. <laughs> and so I, I think we'll find in this passage of Scripture that we just read, we're going to see a father trying to enlighten his son so that he can get safely through the times when darkness surround him and he's trying to help his son to steer clear of bad company and bad companions are a threat to your children bad companions are a threat to you and while we want to love everybody and we want to try to we want to try to get everybody saved who you spend your time with will in large quantity decide what kind of person you are. And so how does this passage warn us about bad company? And that's our subject tonight, bad company. <clears throat> There's three important observations I'd like to make about bad, bad companions tonight. Who they use, what they abuse, and when they lose. Let's take the first one, who they use. We're talking about bad companions. They, they use people. They choose people so they can use people. And bad companions usually have a plan and it's not good. And they're looking for somebody who is naive enough that they'll be sucked in. And so that's why I say the first one of these people who they use, who the bad companions use, number one is the sucker. The naive, gullible, simple one. The sucker. Look at verse 10 again. My son, if sinners entice thee, notice that word, entice. He says, my son. Here's a father who is supposed to be the spiritual leader of his home. Okay. <laughs> He's, he is trying to reason with his son. And he says, my son. If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. 
Now the word there, if sinners entice thee, don't, don't misunderstand what he's saying there. He's not, he's not saying if it ever should happen. What that word means is when it does happen, because it's going to happen. If this time comes, I want you to be prepared for it. And so when it comes, you have to have a problem. If you're going to avoid bad company, you have to have a plan. And that's what the father's doing with this son. He's establishing a plan because the bad company, the sinners who would entice thee, they're the people who are going to look for the most gullible, naive, simple ones they can who will be easily enticed. See, somebody that's strong in the faith, somebody that, that believes the Word of God and they've been practicing Christianity for a while, they won't be nearly so likely to get caught off guard and fall into the trap, into the snare of the bad company who is trying to entice them. And we're calling it the trap of bad company. And it is a trap. And we'll see that by the time we get to the end of this passage. I lived in Chicago when I was 9 and 10 and 11 years old. I was a dumb little hillbilly boy. And you talk about naive, gullible, simple. That was me. I came straight out of the hills, never, never been anywhere in my life outside those hills. And Dad moved us to Chicago. Well, they thought, my mom and Dad kind of thought that it would be safe for me to go outside and hang around whoever I wanted to because they, I guess where they grew up was in the hills of Arkansas, and so I guess they thought it would just be safe like it was when they grew up. But it wasn't that way in Chicago. And I began to find some friends, or they found me, and those friends began to entice me because I found some guys who also had a hillbilly background. And so I thought, these are good guys. These are who, who my friends need to be because we got some things in common. We both speak hillbilly fluently. And, and we both come from the South. And we both got some, some uh, upbringing that's similar. And so I can trust these guys. And so I began to hang out with those guys. You know what? It wasn't very long till we were getting in trouble. Wasn't long till we were causing trouble. And the day the, the police brought me home, along with those other couple of boys, and met my parents at the apartment building, that was a sad day. Here's a nine, ten year old boy riding in the back of a police car. Not because he's getting a thrilling ride, because he wanted to, because he admired the policeman. He's in back there because he's in trouble. Well, that should, have been, that should have been warning enough to me, but I was gullible. I was sim simple. Sucker. So I kept hanging out with those boys. One day they began to talk about something I had never heard of before. They talked, a couple of them were talking. I was just listening. They were talking about doing the glue rag. And I hear that going on for a little while, and I thought, what are they talking about? Glue rag. And they began to explain it to me. They'd take a rag and, and the glue, that airplane glue that they made back then, testers, airplane glue, little yellow tube, it had a, a narcotic in it, a vapor. When you squirt it, you'd squirt the whole tube out on, on a rag and breathe the vapors and it'd make you high. I think they quit making that stuff now. And, but boy, back then it was rampant. I didn't, I'd never heard of such a thing in my life. And there were, a 10-year-old boy getting high on a rag. We put it on a white bobby sock and breathe it. That stuff, can, that stuff can kill your lungs. If I'd have kept it up, I'd probably be dead a long time ago. We got in trouble with that. Why? Because of the bad company I was hanging out with, I didn't know that they couldn't be trusted. I should have known, but I didn't know. And my poor parents were about as naive as I was and they were letting me hang around them. <laughs> Boys and girls, I hope you listen to this because this could have cost me my life. I'm talking about bad company. The one, the one who is easily enticed can end up in deep trouble. Parents need to teach their children 
early, to have integrity and character, to recognize bad company and say, I won't consent to that. No. Stay away from that kind of company. It's not that you don't care about them. It's not that you don't love them. It's not that you don't want them to be saved. It's just that if you hang out with them and you let your kids hang out with them. Listen, little kids are not missionaries. And we, need, we don't need to send them out amongst the wolves as missionaries. A missionary is a grown person. And if we send our kids out to be little missionaries among the, the bad company, guess who's going to end up being the ones influenced? I've heard it said, when you kiss a sick person, kisses a well person, the well person doesn't make the sick person well. The sick person makes the well person sick. And the same way with bad company. When, you're, when, when a good kid is thrown in with bad company, the chances are, unless they have really developed a high degree of character and integrity, they're going to be influenced for the worse instead of the pattern that you thought to set. We need to teach our kids to have character, to do what you tell them to do, when you tell them to do it, not have to tell them ten times, but one time. Hello? One time. If they don't obey and listen to you the first time, if you keep letting them harangue you and nag you until you just finally give in, you're making the kid into a person that has flawed character. And so we need to teach them to have character by getting them to be people of integrity when they're still young and can be shaped. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. So the key there is to early training, and then when they get old, they'll be more resistant to giving in to the bad company and their enticement. Hello? Hey, we're, we're learning here some things that God wants us to know. In a worldly and carnal Egypt, Joseph was offered love and pleasure by Potiphar's wife, but he had grown up with a father who had apparently taught him character and, and uh, integrity. And when she, had, she enticed him, guess what he said? No! And the Bible says... As soon as he saw that he was trying to be enticed, he jerked away from her and ran. He ran so fast that his coat slipped off and she was standing there holding his coat. Man, he, he got out of there in a hurry. And that's the way we ought to do sin. That's the way we ought to teach our children. When our children are, are enticed by somebody to smoke dope, it ought to be, no, the first answer. As soon as they're tempted and enticed to smoke a cigarette, no, as soon as somebody tries to get them to drink their first drink of beer or wine, of booze of some kind, no! And you learn. Teach your kids to say no, not to you, but to the sinner. <laughs> Hello? Solomon warned against the kind of bad company who would troll for the simpletons, simpletons and, the, and the gullible. Don't be the gullible one. I hate it when I've been taken for a fool, don't you? <laughs> I've been taken for a fool a few times and I don't like it. And so I want, to be, I want to be alert enough and I want to learn from the Proverbs and from all of the Word of God, I want to learn how to spot the enticement that's going to lead me astray and say, no! So the first one that we, we learn about in this passage of Scripture that... that uh, that the bad company uses is who? He's the sucker, the gullible one. The second one is the selfish one. Who else is the bad company looking for? He's looking for the selfish one, the one who wants to get all he can and can all he gets. The selfish one who has a lust and a desire inside to gather to him everything at any cost. Proverbs 1.13. It says, we shall find all precious substance. See how they're enticing the, 
the simple guy, the gullible guy. He says, we shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. See, if they're trying to get him to pitch in and go into thievery, let's, let's do whatever we have to do to get gain, to get what we want, to satisfy our own selfishness. We'll do whatever we have to do. And that's the, when you spot that in bad company, run from them. Say, no. So it's the selfish. Greed and lust promise great reward for all those who are willing to risk the venture. If you're willing to throw in with them, they'll say, come on, go with us. Go with us. We'll steal this or we'll do that. We'll lie. We'll cheat. We'll do whatever we have to do. But there'll be great reward in it for us. Well, it doesn't turn out that way. And we're going to see at the end of the chapter how it turns out. In verse 14, he says, Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. Well, that sounds like socialism, doesn't it? Let us all have one purse. Communism. Let us all have one purse. Let's just let's tax, the, let's tax the people that are working and get all their money and put it all into one purse. I, I think that's what's being taught in America right now is having one purse. We'll all get our money in one purse. The bad part is it's the working guy that's putting the money in the purse and the guy that doesn't work gets it. <laughs> greed. In this passage of scripture, we're talking about greed. Bad company will focus on that one who's greedy and use that greed to entice him to come into their company because they're promising him great reward. And <laughs> America's being fed godless ideals right now. And... Uh, there's a moral upheaval. And I think what happens, if I remember the way that socialism and communism has happened in other countries, when, when the morals are torn down, history are torn down, and they're out to get religion, and they want to knock out Christianity, and they want to do away with the Bible, and nothing, there's no moral absolutes. There's no absolute truth. And so everybody has their own version of the truth. And then chaos ensues once, I mean, isn't that what they're trying to do with gender identity thing? I mean, I read today where uh, a woman has decided she, she's decided she doesn't know what she is. She's non-binary. <laughs> and she's chosen her own pronouns. Instead of being called she, she wants to be called they. The English language makes they a plural pronoun. <laughs> And so unless she's got multiple personalities, she doesn't need to be called they. But that's what they're trying to do is confuse everything until people are ready to accept anything that looks like order. And, and I think it's got its roots right here. Greed seeks to entangle participants so they don't lose them. So bad company does this. Bad company says, come on with us. Man, you're going to profit from this. This is going to be a great time. We're going to have so much fun. Go ahead and take that pill. You're going to love the way you feel. Go ahead and drink that bottle, and it's going to make you feel fabulous. Of course, you won't that night when you're throwing up in the commode on your knees. They don't tell you that part. <laughs> bad company seeks out the sucker, seeks out the selfish, and thirdly, he seeks out, the bad company seeks out the soulless. The one who seems to have no soul, no, no compassion, no heart, no mercy, no compassion on anything or anybody. The soulless one. This is the kind of person who would, would drown puppies under the water. The soulless. We're talking about bad company, who they look for. They're looking for the sucker, they're looking for the selfish one, and they're looking for the soulless one. The one who is hardened and calloused. And he'll become more calloused once he gets around the bad company. That's the way it works. Verse number 11. If they say, come with us, let us, now watch this, let us lay wait for blood. Do you see the soullessness in that? He's saying, we're, gonna, we're going after blood. If we have to cut somebody's throat to get what we want, we'll do it. That's what they're saying. We're going after blood. So let us lurk, 
privily, slinking around, hiding in the shadows. Boy, parents ought not let their kids be out in the dark. You know what all kinds of sin happens in the darkness? Parents ought to have, parents ought to have curfews on their kids. The later they're out, the more wickedness is out there that will find them. They won't even have to look. So how do you know that, preacher? Been there, done that. Lurking privily out of the, out of the eye shot and earshot of mom and dad. Out in the place where they think nobody will see, nobody will hear. We're looking for ways that we can shed blood and we're going we're gonna to do it privily. And he says, let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Hey, who are, this is that calloused, soulless person. He said, we're, we're going after blood and we don't care if they're innocent. Read today an article where an 18-year-old guy kidnapped a little four-year-old out of his bed and brutally murdered him. Brutally murdered a, a four-year-old. Can you think of anything more soulless than that? Mm. I'm for the death penalty, by the way. A four-year-old kid. Can you imagine the torture and the horror that that kid went through before he finally died? Awful. Awful. Oh, that's the kind of person that the bad company's talking about here. There, there seems to be no limit to how far they will go. Let us shed blood. Let us shed innocent blood. Let's, let's put them in the grave. We don't care if they die. It means nothing to us. As long as we get what we want. If they're innocent, it's okay. You know why a lot of people join gangs and get into groups that are bad company? A lot of people do it because they, they want to belong to something. And that's why we've got to be careful as parents watching out where we let our kids belong. I suggest that there's a lot of groups, even some that are publicly sanctioned, and even school groups and sometimes even church groups that our kids ought not to be a part of. If a group is leading our children away from the Lord instead of closer to the Lord just say no not going to do that for I'm afraid my kids will get mad at me let them get mad you're the parent <laughs> right hello I think a lot of parenting is meeting failure today because parents are afraid of their children afraid to disappoint their children Afraid their children will be mad at them? Afraid it won't be daddy's girl or daddy's boy or mommy's girl or mommy's boy anymore? Look, they'll get mad once in a while. You go ahead and be the parent. They'll get over it. But if they fall with bad company, they might not get over that. Proverbs 1.12 says, Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. Boy, there's a lack of respect and compassion in the bad company. That's why we've got to be careful who we watch on TV and allow our children to watch on TV. I, I absolutely despise the shows that make a mockery out of, the, out of a two-parent family where there's a mom and a dad and they love each other, and dad leads the family, and the kids, I, I, I hate the shows where the kids are smart Alex and back talk their parents, and make their dad to look like a buffoon, and use their mother, and misuse their mother, and abuse their mother. I, I hate those shows, and I don't think any of us ought to be watching them, because bad Companions will corrupt good manners. And the shows, the movies we watch, 
believe it or not, and the games that we play. I, I saw a game. I was on uh, Facebook today, and, and there's a game, a sponsored game. I don't even play games on the computer, but there's a sponsored game that popped up, and I just stopped you know, scrolling, and I looked at it for a minute to see what it was doing, and it showed this, this uh, young woman running down the street. She's running down the street, and she runs up bes- behind some unsuspecting person and slugs them in the head and knocks them to the ground. And she runs a little further and she finds another one and trips them and kicks them while they're down. And she's going from one person to the other, slugging them while they're not looking and kicking them while they're down. I'm thinking, is that kind of game good for somebody to play, especially Christians? I wonder why we have so much violence in America when stuff like this is promoted and our not only the games, but the shows we watch and TV programs. That's bad company. Proverbs 1.16 says, For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Knowing the treachery of evil, knowing the treachery of evil is to know that it's certainly going to boomerang one of these days. You can only do evil and wicked so long and it's going to boomerang and come back. In the Proverbs we'll find later on in the Proverbs it says, He that diggeth a pit, he shall fall therein. Boomerang. You try to hurt others often enough, one day it'll come back. Now, non-believers call that karma. No, it's, it's sowing and reaping is what it is. The Bible. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So we talked about whom bad company will use. Now let's quickly look at what they abuse. When someone is chosen to be in the bad company, the father Solomon here is talking to his son. He's saying, son, don't join up with that bad crowd. Don't join up with them. Because if you do, here's what's going to happen. There's going to be some abuse of the one who joined up with the bad company. In Proverbs 1.15, My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. You know what he's saying there? He's saying again, say to them, No, stay away from them. When people get entangled in a bad situation, sometimes they hurt themselves, don't they? I used to watch the Three Stooges. They used to be my heroes. And I watched the Three Stooges. I remember this one Three Stooges show. And How many of you watched the Three Stooges before? Okay, good. So you know what I'm talking about. Well, while we're, while we're running the questionnaire, how many of you had poke salad and purple hull peas and cornbread and pork chop for supper last night? Brother Denny started to lie and then he put his hand down. <laughs> how many of you have had poke salad this year? Okay, see... There's a lot of teachings got to be done here, but I, I, I better get back to the Three Stooges, the serious stuff. <laughs> the Three Stooges, Mo and Shemp. Shemp was my favorite one. Mo and Shemp, they're, they're kind of all tangled up, wrestling, and, and their arms are tangled up, and their legs are tangled up, and, and, and Shemp's got this hand right in his face. And he said, Mo, move your hand. Get your hand off of my face. Mo said, my hand's not on your face. He said, I'm telling you, move your hand off my face. Mo said, that's not my hand on your face. Shemp said, all right, I warned you. Ah, and he bit down on it, and then Shemp went, ah, that's my own hand. And sometimes we, we hurt ourselves, and that's bad. But we hurt other people too. When we join bad company, have you ever heard somebody that's going the wrong way, and you try to give them a little gentle correction? And they say, look, I'm not hurting anybody but myself. That's why people who drink say that. I used to say it. It's stupid, but I used to say it. People do drugs. I'm not hurting anybody but my own self. Somebody that's doing a lot of stuff wrong, they make that excuse. Well, I'm not hurting anybody but myself. Don't worry about me. Well, Solomon is a, a loving father here in this passage of Scripture. And young people who are headed down the wrong road, when they say, I'm not hurting anybody but myself, that's wrong. How do they hurt other people? Well, they abuse their parents 
that hurt their parents who tried to teach them the right way to go and it's like spitting in their face. When they join up with the bad company and against that father's admonition, it's like spitting in that father's face when they go the wrong way. It's like spitting in the training face when they go the wrong way. It's abuse also to God. We know God wants us to go in the right way. God, do you think for a minute God wants us to join up, link up, and run with the bad crowd, the bad company? Of course not. So we're spitting in God's face when we join up with the bad crowd. We abuse God. If we join up with bad company, we, ab we abuse our own fellow citizens, fellow man. Because in this passage of Scripture, you see what they're doing. They're, they're, they're abusing people, and they don't care if it kills them. And they abuse future possibilities. Listen to this. Young people, listen to me. When you join up with the bad crowd, are you listening, young folks? Everybody. <laughs> when you join up with the bad crowd and you're headed the wrong way, you really hurt your future possibilities. A felon, for example, there are certain privileges of citizenship that gets taken away from a felon. Even though he might repent, get saved, and try to live for the Lord later, he still lost certain privileges. There's certain places he can't work anymore. And there's certain privileges like voting that's taken away. And so he, he hurts his own future possibilities. I've read so many times about young girls who take these instruments which is a very good instrument if used properly. But so many girls use these, the camera, take nude pictures of themselves. And it gets out yonder, oh, you might think you're sending it privately. Once it's out there in the web, it's like a belch. It ain't coming back. <laughs> and it stinks. Girls have taken nude pictures of themselves and shared it with somebody they thought would keep it private and then their future possibilities are shot because of that or because they've done something illegal with the bad company they were in and then that's known. Maybe it's posted on Facebook. I've seen criminals get caught all the time on Facebook because they're stupid enough to post it on Facebook while they're committing a crime and the police just go arrest them. Remember we talked about the simple ones, the gullible ones? <laughs> yeah. Had a, a girl, a young woman. I think she was still pretty much a girl. Came to my house. She was crying. She didn't know me. She didn't even know I was a preacher. She didn't even know anybody was home. I happened to be out there working on my car, and she, uh, she came up and asked me if she could use the phone. And so I'm looking around. You know, these days you got to be careful. I'm looking around to see if anybody's with her, if they're going to attack me from the, around the corner of the house or something. And so she wants to use the phone. And so I asked her a couple of questions. Well, what's, what's your problem? You got breakdown out there on the road or something? Uh, no, she tried to describe it. There's, there's family troubles serious family troubles and after she made a couple of calls I asked my wife if she was about to lose some children the police were going to uh, take her kids because uh, she had been accused of deserting them I don't know what all of this was true and untrue but I'm just telling you what, what it appeared to be and uh, so she had to get there Right away, she didn't ask me to give her a ride, but I volunteered and asked my wife to go with me. I don't, I wouldn't ride around with a young lady by myself that I don't, especially one I don't know, because that can lead to disaster too. And so, I asked my wife, and we we took her a few miles to where her kids were. And it's obvious, you know, she had bruises on her and skin places and bleeding places. This girl I'm talking about, the young mother, 
she'd been beaten. And uh, when we got there, I told her, I said, now look, I, I'm not going to get out and get in the middle. I don't even know what's going on. So I'm not going to get out and get shot. Uh, I'll give you a ride back if you want to pick up the kids and go back to wherever you're going. I'll, I'll take you. But I'm not getting out in a fist fight with anybody, and I don't want to get shot. So, <laughs> so uh, I said, I'll give you five minutes to uh, figure out if you can get the kids. Well, when we got there, the police were already there. And uh, <clears throat> she'd been into it with a boyfriend. Here, here's the bottom line. She was in great turmoil, shedding a lot of tears because she thought she was about to lose her kids. And this boyfriend had beaten her up. While she was talking to the sheriff's deputy, one of her little kids came up to the window of my car. And so I began to talk to the little boy. And he said... His mother was looking, her, her husband had committed suicide, but now she needed a father for her husband, so she was looking for somebody who would be a good and kind dad for, to her and the kids. But instead, he beat her up. What's wrong with that picture? She's looking in all the wrong places. How about finding some guy in church instead of out in a gang? How about finding a guy who's living for the Lord instead of some guy who's out there doing drugs? How about finding somebody who loves the Lord and lives for the Lord and goes to church instead of somebody who's getting drunk and, and beating up women? How about that? If I'm saying she was in bad company looking for a man who would be kind to her and her children and she picked the worst possible scenario. You know why we need this book? We need this book to be preached and taught to people so they can make wise choices. That's what Proverbs is all about, is making wise choices to stay out of bad company and live for God instead. I felt sorry for her. I invited her to church. I haven't seen her since. I don't know what happened. I asked her if she needed to ride home, and she said, well, the... the uh, Deputy was going to take her and give her a ride. So my wife and I left, and I know no more about what happened. But I, I do see in real life people getting hooked up with bad company and what can happen because of it. Notice the third and last thing. The bad companions, who they use, what they abuse, and when they lose. I guess you could call them losers. Look at verse number 17 in our text. Proverbs 1, 17. This verse used to amaze me. Now I see it in its context for what it really means. Watch this. Verse 17. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. I used to think, what in the world is going on here? Did Solomon get off on this thing of trapping birds? What's that got to do with anything we've just talked about or going to talk about? But it's right smack dab in the middle of this passage we're talking about tonight. And he's talking about a snare, a trap that's set for a bird. He's saying, if you get down there where the birds are and, and you set a trap and they're watching you set the trap, they're going like, duh, does he think we're going to get in that? <laughs> we saw him set the trap. And they're going to back off and say, no, we're not as gullible as you are. We're not getting in that trap. What Solomon is saying is, my son, if you're wise and listen to me, what I'm trying to tell you, if you're wise, you'll see the trap and you will avoid it. The trap of bad company. Say no and stay away from it. We see verse 18. And they lay late, they lay wait. Now this is the bad company that he's warning his son about. And they lay late, lay wait. That's hard to say. You try saying it. They, they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. You know what he's saying? He's saying they're going to get caught in their own trap. Thugs who are setting traps refuse to see the boomerang that's going to get sprung on them. Verse 19. Now here, this explains it. The last verse of our text. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners 
thereof. So the father summarizes the ways of evil. He's saying, my son, stay away from the bad company. Tell them no, don't go with them. And if you go with them, here's the characteristics that'll let you know. Here's the clues that'll let you know they're bad company. And if you'll, if you'll just watch long enough, son, you'll see that bad company, they're going to set a trap for others and sooner or later that trap's going to get sprung on them. What goes around comes around. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You dig a pit, you're going to fall in your own pit. Our daughter liked a boy when she was a teenager. She was going, our daughter was in a Christian school. She liked a boy that was in another Christian school. He wrote, they were writing each other. And I intercepted one of the letters. I found out by reading it with my own two eyes that that boy was saying things to her that was very inappropriate. And I sat down with her and I said, this will not work. That boy is not going to be your boyfriend. You say, you told her that? Yep, and I'd do it again. And that's what you ought to do. I said, you're not going to have him as a boyfriend and I'm going to find his dad and talk to him. And I did. Drove 40 miles out of my way to another church in another town to talk to that boy's dad. Went to his place of business asking if I could talk to him. He said, sure. And so I sat down with him and told him what had happened. And I told him the same thing I told my daughter. I said, your boy has said the inappropriate things. I had the letter with me. I said, here, you can read it yourself. I said, this is not Christian. And I don't intend for my daughter to be involved with a boy that says such things. And you can do whatever you want to with your boy. I'm showing you what he said. And you can deal with him however you feel fit. But as for my daughter, she's not going to see him anymore. And I'd appreciate your cooperation about it. And he assured me that he would. And we prayed together and I left. <laughs> well, <clears throat> daughter, my daughter was mad at me for a while. <laughs> see, I said earlier, parents fail a lot of times because they're afraid their kids will get mad at them. I saved her life. And she would thank me today if I brought this up to her. I suspect she doesn't want to talk about it anymore. But it was all broke off that day. And eventually, in the years to come, she went to a Bible college and she met a guy who was a good Christian fella and married him. And they're still married today. And I'm proud of her. She's a fine Christian young woman, but I wasn't going to let her get entrapped with bad company. And I put a stop to it. And parents, I'm saying, you are responsible for your family. And a lot of the, the violence in America could be reduced dramatically if there was some good parenting going on. The reason a lot of these thugs are killing people and demonstrating and rioting and burning people's houses down and businesses down because they had poor parenting. It ought not to be so with Christians. Oh, you say, Pastor, did you really read your daughter's mail? You bet. And I would again. And I think parents owe it to their children to guard them that way. I don't think anything's going to be too private for the parents' eyes. America could change if dad would stay in the home and quit going out and getting drunk and doing drugs. And maybe, maybe some dad's not doing drugs or getting drunk. They might just be so tied up with their job they've got, never got time to, to nurture their family in the things of God. Whatever draws a man away, if it's drawing him away from being a good father, he needs to put it away. Mom, boy, it's important to be a good mom. It's important to be a good dad. It's important to have mom and dad. I understand there's single families, single parent families, and, and I'm not downgrading those people at all. I'm just saying that if we started living God's way, 
and attempt to hold our families together where there's a mom and a dad and the kids all in the home, the nuclear family, if we could hold that together and moms and dads are training their kids properly, we'd see a lot less craziness in our nation today. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Help us, Lord, to recognize bad company. And it's not just kids that choose bad company. Adults make some horrible decisions about who to hang out with. Lord, help us to make up our minds to love everyone, witness to those who are lost, invite them to church, but to make our best friends Christian friends. Put our kids in a place where they'll have good encouragement to live for the Lord instead of being downtrodden because of what they believe. I pray you'd bless us. Help us to choose good company. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And I'd like to ask you to stand, if you would. If you'd stand with me, we'll have, we'll have a verse or two of invitation.